you. All right, I think we'll get started. I think people will probably be filtering kind of in and out. Um, greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to be discussing um, the Atascadero Creek, um, we're, a number of studies that we've done in support of the sedimentation analysis and this passage design project. This has been a collaboration um, between a number of um, our design team um, folks, and so most of us are going to be presenting this evening. So our agenda will start um, with an overview, and Arthur Dawson will be discussing the historical ecology review, and Marcia Obazinski will be discussing the Salmon Creek monitoring summary. And we'll have a wetland ecology and uh, water and sediment quality summary from Noah Hume, and some set the sediment dynamic, hydraulic modeling, and the intermediate design um, that we've been working on will be presented by Jeremy Cohor and Matt O'Connor. And we're hoping for some feedback from the community on this. Um, and um, we would like to have questions. Um, there'll be an opportunity for questions after each speaker. So please um, hold your questions or put them into the chat, unless it's a really important question about some um, something that's keeping you from understanding what's being discussed. Um, and I also uh, wanted to let you know that this is being recorded. Um, and um, uh, that if you have um, any feedback for us, um, that we would love to get that. If you don't want to do it during the meeting, that we would love to receive um, that feedback after um, after the meeting. So, hi, I'm Sierra. I am the ecologist for the Gold Ridge Art Resource Conservation District. Um, and the RCD, you guys see my cursor switching around? Yeah. Great. The RCD, um, so the Gold Ridge RCD, there are a number of RCDs, um, but the Gold Ridge RCD um, is the one that we are um, currently in and that the Atascadero Green Valley Watershed is in. And we're bounded in on the north by the Russian River, on the east by the Laguna de Santa Rosa, on the south by the Estero Americano, and on the west by the Pacific Ocean. And Gold Ridge RCD facilitates stewardship projects to address water quality, climate change, biodiversity, ecosystem health, water quantity on public and private lands by providing technical assistance, outreach, education, project implementation facilitation. Gold Ridge RCD is non-regulatory, like confidential, and we provide free assistance to the community. So this is on that pink shape that I just showed you of our Gold Ridge boundary. This is now zoomed in. And tonight we're going to be focusing on the Green Valley Atascadero watershed, which is here in kind of this light green color with the Gold Ridge office smack in the middle of it. Atascadero Creek is a tributary to the Green Valley Creek, and um, Mershka is going to be discussing um, that how important um, the Green Valley watershed is in the scheme of recovery of the salmon in the Russian River. But I will mention that. Green Valley Creek was the last Russian River tributary to sustain three year classes of coho salmon and has been instrumental in coho recovery efforts in the Russian River watershed. So, we're going to be focusing further in on the Atascadero um, portion in the marsh. And for folks who may be a little bit new to information about these watersheds and would like kind of a larger overview, our project partners and the RCD have been working in this watershed for many years. And we've got two watershed management plans, one for Green Valley Creek, which we did in 2014, and one in the Atascadero sub watershed that we finished in 2021. So if you'd like more information, these documents are available on our website and are really good kind of primers for the watershed information. So tonight we're going to be focusing in kind of on recommendations, restoration recommendations that came out of those two planning efforts that I just showed you the management plans for. And real focus um, has been on the watershed management piece and restoration efforts for the lower Green Valley area has been a lot on off-channel habitat and floodplain reconnection through the lower section of Green Valley Creek, down through here. And for Atascadero Creek, We've been looking at the hydrologic um, enhancement of hydrologic connection of altered creek reaches. 
um, in the wetland and floodplain habitats to look at watershed function and also to improve passage for salmonids. So we're focusing in on kind of just each slide getting a little bit closer in. Um, so this area that we basically that we've been studying for the last three years has been diving into understanding this lower section of the marsh, which is downstream of the Green Valley Road crossing. And through our initial assessment efforts, we um, identified a sediment accumulation area um, in this lower section of the marsh that's downstream of the Green Valley Road crossing. And this revealed that there has been some aggregation of sediment, which means building up of sediment in that lower Atascadero channel. And it's changed that marsh that used to be more perennial. And there's, you will hear from Arthur, the, the, the question of when you start actually tracking this. But what we've seen from the perspective of coho passage is that this, this seasonal, um, we have now this, it used to be a seasonal wetland with a creek running through it. Now it's more of a perennial marsh with open water, and that's led to these low dissolved oxygen concentrations um, and reduced hydrologic interactions. So these conditions impact salmonids. Um, both coho salmon and sealhead trout are found in the Green Valley watershed, um, and it's an issue for them both migrating in and out for really high quality habitats. It's in the upper watershed up in this Redwood and Honeys Creek area. Okay. So this is kind of that marsh area. This is Green Valley Road here at the very bottom of the page. That's the crossing right there. And then this is this marsh area that we're discussing that's down in this area. And the sediment accumulation is loosely bounded in by these white lines. Jeremy and Matt will give you much better maps and description of that. So one of the things during our um, water quality monitoring to support the Atascadero Watershed Management Plan um, Boulder staff observed dead coho salmon under the Green Valley Road Bridge. And that mortality event caused us to look further into the water quality and habitat conditions, specifically down in that lower marsh area. Um, Mershka is going to describe to you about coho that are being um, released into the upper part of the watershed. So this was down at the bottom. And a number of fish did make it through the marsh under um, further into that storm cycle. But this was something that we wanted to take a look at. And this is just a quick primer for um, what kind of what led us into this the designs you're about to see tonight. So this was in spring of 2019, it was during a May storm. And you can see here, this is water quality data that we collected just downstream of the Green Valley Road Bridge. And the thing that I wanted to point out was that you have these, this is a relatively wet spring, but you get these bumps in dissolved oxygen, which is this yellow line. Oh, sorry, the green line, and there are two different locations. So they're both dissolved oxygen, but there are two different instruments that are right next to each other. But between storms, you would get this area where the dissolved oxygen would come down to almost zero after each storm. And so that was one of the conditions that we were trying to take a look at with this divide that we're going to be discussing. And I wanted to point out while we're going to be focusing a whole lot on coho salmon tonight, because they're a keystone species and they play an essential role in the health and function of ecosystems and are an indicator of ecosystem health. I also wanted to just touch on that that all of the creatures that work and live um, in the Atascadero and Green Valley watershed are all supported and we're working on function of these so that we can support all of the ecosystem function and habitat within it. So again, we're, we would like to get um, feedback from the community. And whenever you have a question, if you can either pop it into the chat or um, jot it down to ask each speaker at the end of their um, presentation, that would be wonderful. And I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Arthur, who I have to make a co-host. Arthur, can you see that? Um, let's see. I just got another. Can you still see me? I uh, can see your screen. Okay. Um, is, is that good enough? Should I just go ahead and start? You can. You're not in presenter mode, but you. Oh. Well, we let me um on. let me start the slideshow and then let me know if this. So is that? I'm not really familiar with presenter mode. Is this what you mean? Just uh. No, we're now we're seeing, I think, kind of your background screen. If you go into your um you up at the top, I just had trouble with this as well. So <laughs> um 
if you go into your PowerPoint slide, once you push um, presentation from beginning, it will ask you up at the top, you can do display settings and you can switch. Uh, sorry. So up, up by from the beginning, from the current slide, um, I've never had to do this before. Um, let's see, display settings. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If you, if uh, you have, if it's coming up into on two different screens, you can swap those screens. Uh, okay. Well, I've got, I thought I chose, so you're, so what, what are you seeing right now? Um, a field of beautiful star cells. Oh yeah. Okay. Actually, they're not. They're wildflowers in Bear Valley, but uh, oh, good, oh, good, not start this. Um, well, hold on one sec. Sorry, I thought if I want to share my screen, I clicked on. Oh, I know what's going on. Maybe. Um, all right, is that better? Yes. Okay. Then let me. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. How's that? It's not in presenter mode, but it's fine. We can see your slides. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why, but okay, I'll just I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, okay, well, thanks, thanks, Sierra, and I appreciate the opportunity to to share um, the research that I did on the historical ecology um, of the Atascadero Green Valley watershed. And um, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, you already showed this map, so I won't be covering all these creeks, but uh, Purrington Creek will be mentioned, as well as Atascadero and Green Valley, and and uh, possibly a couple of the other ones. And one of the interesting things about the research was that when I started looking into um, into the historical maps, um, Atascadero, as many people know, means uh, marsh or bog. And I was expecting to find some old Mexican era maps that would show a marsh or a bog. And I didn't find any historical maps before 1933. So this is the earliest map that actually shows a marsh in the watershed. Um, I, I don't know what that means. You can ponder it. You know, maybe if it was just seasonal wetland, it wasn't shown. Maybe it was drained before anybody made a map. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of a, a mystery to ponder. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to talk about land use um, in different areas and then and then get into uh, impacts and then um, and then end up with the fish. Um, so I want to start with the indigenous era and also acknowledge that um, we're still in the indigenous era. There's still indigenous people around. Um, Heron Shadow, which is in the watershed, is a, uh, a really inspiring place if you have a chance to visit there, um, being uh, stewarded by uh, Pomo people and other indigenous folks. So just a, a recommendation there. Um, and one thing we sometimes forget about the indigenous era is that people still needed a lot of resources. And they had to tend the land in ways that that gave them what they needed. Um, like Green Valley, Atascadero probably had um, several hundred people uh, back in the day, you know, before 1800. So that's a lot of people to provide for. Uh, so just to give an example of uh, of something that was resource intensive, this is a roundhouse. It's up in the Sierra, but uh, there were roundhouses like this in Sonoma Valley, probably 50 feet across. Um, you know, you could gather. A lot of people in a place like this for um, ceremonies and dances and things. So um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of tending of the land that went on in those days. And um, one of the most significant things that happened was the cultural burning uh, on a regular basis, which kept things quite open and um, you know helped increase the food supply. And as an example of how that looked on the ground, um, the town of Windsor was named by an early English pioneer who compared it to the grounds of Windsor Castle uh, because he saw these beautiful oaks and it was it looked so well tended. And Windsor Castle, the grounds have been described as neat as a sixpence. And you know, it's a royal garden. So that's a well tended place. And Sonoma County was also a well tended place. So these are um, these are quotes from early pioneers, but they give some sense of the abundance of wildlife back in those days. Um, you know, 19 grizzly bears crossing Purrington Creek, I think would have made the hair stand up in the back of my neck, uh, but kind of an amazing picture. Um, you know, elk in droves of probably dozens, if not hundreds in the open spaces, uh, if it was anything like Sonoma Valley. Um, and then lots of fishing, that's a good fish. Uh, salmon and trout uh, were mentioned by the early pioneers. And then over in the Laguna de Santa Rosa, Vallejo, described, um, you know, lots and lots of beaver over there. 
And there's no historical record of beaver in the Tascadero, but um, I would be very surprised if it wasn't a similar situation here in, in a Tascadero because uh, you know conditions were would have been conducive for them, I think. So actually, it was it was the beavers that would have brought the Russians in um, because they were looking for furs, and they established Fort Ross, and they were going after otter in the ocean and also beaver on land. And it could be that the beaver were wiped out before there was really a record uh, of beaver being here. Um, and they also um, settled uh, Chernick Farm on Purrington Creek to help supply Fort Ross. So, you know, acres of fields and, and um, they were starting to move inland when Fort Ross closed down. And then, or then Chernick Farm also closed about the same time and, and it was abandoned. Um, so then the, the Russians uh, moved aside and the Mexican settlers came in. And the mainstay of their economy was the cattle trade. And so, uh, you know, if you were well-connected, you could get a land grant of covering thousands of acres. And there were a couple um, in the area. There was the um, uh, Cañada de Honive, and there was also the uh, El Molino grant. And um, and the basic idea was to run large herds of cattle and, and uh, you know, both for food and also for trade for the hides. And that probably had uh, some very significant effects on the stream beds as the cattle, you know, ran around and and tromped through the water. And um, and then the Americans came in. Uh, so uh, 1850 was the first recorded settler in Atascadero Green Valley, and that was uh, Isaac uh, Sullivan, who still has some namesake places around the, the watershed. And in the early days. Um, about two thirds of the men were engaged in farming. So you can see the crops there. They also, they continued the cattle that the Mexicans had um, and also started orchards. And by the way, the the, um, the Russians may have brought in the Gravenstein. They may be the, that may be the original source of the Gravenstein apple, which is kind of a cool little factoid. Um, and then about a third of the men were engaged in milling, at least by 1855. So that was another significant thing going on in those early, early days. Um, but not too long after that, um, the charcoal industry started up. Uh, woodcutters came in, cut down hardwoods and made charcoal. And when the railroad got here in the 1870s, suddenly there was an easy way to ship stuff out. And there was a tremendous demand in San Francisco and other parts of the Bay Area for charcoal to heat your home and also to cook over. So, and this was true all over Sonoma County. There was a lot of woodcutting that went on just for charcoal. And you know, continuing through the 19th century, um, you know, the Green Valley and that that kind of that name applied to the whole area. Uh, Green Valley was, you know, more and more dedicated to fruit culture, um, also some hops. They started thinking about ways to preserve the product so it could be shipped out. Um, they tried peaches for a while. Uh, it was kind of a big peach rush and they overplanted and the bottom fell out of the market. And then the peaches were killed off by blight. So um, that was kind of the end of into the peaches here. Um, and then most of those orchards went into apples eventually. And so by the mid 20th century, this was called the most concentrated apple area in the world. Um, and quarter of the nation's dried apples came from uh, Green Valley. And the production peaked in 1966 and then began to fall off. And some of the land use impacts, um, you know, they dumped agricultural waste right into the creeks and right on the stream banks. So it would just sit there and rot, you know, tremendous quantities of this stuff, which um, which must have really impacted the water quality. Uh, this is by someone who grew up here uh, talking about holding your nose for six months because it smelled so bad. Um, then, you know, they're spraying with um, pesticides and herbicides. And then the sediment in the creek from all the various land uses was increasing. And then eventually by the 80s, um, the apples were becoming less viable. So a lot of places went to vineyards. And you know, the sale of, of homes, uh, residences also increased. Um, so I, I want to jump into um, channel changes because um, this is where some of this uh, some of this land use kind of expresses itself. And this is one of the most interesting spots in the whole watershed, I would say. And, and what this map is showing, this is 1867. And at that time, um, this is Green Valley Creek. It's got a different name in that day, but this is Green Valley Creek. And then this is Purrington right here. And you can see that they have separate confluences with the Tascadero, which is not true today by any means. Um, so an interesting 
And here's the, the general area that's taking place in. So if you know Green Valley Road and you know this S curve, uh, today you drive over the bridge and the bridge is right at this the northern uh, bend in the S curve. So putting the old map on top of a topo, here, here's the S curve. And you can see it's going right in between those two channels, the uh, Green Valley and um, Purrington that were flowing par basically parallel at that spot. But go ahead another 10 years, and by that time, you guys can see my cursor, right? Comes and goes. Oh, it comes and goes. Okay, well, down in the lower left of the of the map on the left, uh, you can see where Purrington and Green Valley Creek come together, and that was that was that was a hydro modification that uh, the local people must have done at that time. So they brought them together into one channel, and at that time they crossed under Green Valley Road at the southern part of that S-curve, different than today. Then you go ahead 21 years later, and now the creek is crossing under the northern bend in the S-curve. So they, they had muckied around with stuff there quite a bit. Um, and you know we forget sometimes that you don't really need heavy equipment to do this kind of thing. Um, here's a ditch that was dug by uh, Lori Seward's father and uncle. This is Sonoma Valley, but I'm just using this as an example of how quickly these kinds of changes could happen, even with two two guys with a couple shovels. Um, in just a matter of weeks, they managed to dig this trench that was, you know, several hundred yards long to get water from a well out to an orchard. So this kind of thing could be accomplished pretty easily, even by hand. So moving from the channel changes to the changes in the marshland, um, as I mentioned, um, the earliest mapping of the marsh happened, it was surveyed in 19, between 1933 and 1935 is the first time uh, this marshland shows up on a map. And uh, at that point, and here's Green Valley, whoops, Green Valley Creek coming down. And this is more or less the confluence with the Tascadero Creek, which is uh, coming right through here. And uh, so 1934, the marsh extended about 2,400 feet upstream of the confluence and just a little bit downstream and go ahead 20 years to 1953. And by that time, uh, the marsh extended more than a mile upstream. So the marsh had more than doubled in length um, and now goes under Green Valley Road or whatever you want to call that. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's reached Green Valley Road and gone beyond it. And then if you go ahead to uh, 1968, uh, the marsh has gone even further, so now it's uh, increased another 400 feet. So a total of 600 feet, um, six, uh, sorry, 6,000 feet upstream from the confluence uh, by 1968. So it's increased uh, about 3,600 feet between 1934 and 1968. But if you go ahead to the modern day, it really hasn't changed much, uh, at least not obviously on the maps. So uh, something you know, things happened and then they sort of slowed down and the rate of change uh, maybe stopped or really, really slowed down. Um, so I'm not gonna try to explain all these maps, but these show the basic changes in the channels uh, between 1867 and 1898. And then down here is uh, 1953. But I wanted to think about like how those channel changes might have impacted the sediment transport through the area and how uh, changing confluences might have uh, you know, changed where the sediment was being deposited or where it was being carried through. And um, so it's just something I think is important to keep in mind. So the contributing factors from the historical record of the sediment wedge uh, would include hydro modification, um, agricultural land use, um, like the horse crossing, which will be covered later probably downstream, uh, Lake Grayton, you know, straight into the channel, whoops. Um, and then also some high rainfall events uh, in the early 80s. And there's apparently um, a lot of sediment came down in the early 80s. Um, so that may have also contributed to the formation of the sediment wedge. And so meanwhile, the, the fish are continuing to use the creek. Um, in the early days, as I mentioned, there was, you know, it was known for salmon and steelhead. Um, that continued through the 19th century. And really up until about the mid 20th century, it, it fluctuated somewhat, but there was still uh, considered to be a good place to go fishing for salmon and trout uh, right up till the middle of the middle and even the 1960s. And then um, and then by the end of the 60s, uh, they were reporting that trout and salmon were in decline in the watershed. 
And um, let's see, I think I'm missing part of this. Yeah. Um, and then by the 1980s, there were efforts going on to start uh, planting fingerling trout and um, and then eventually also uh, uh, coho smolts in the watershed. And you'll hear more about that, I'm sure. And so this is just a broad overview of, of all the reports I could find of uh, salmonids in the watershed. So all the tributaries are on the left, the, um, the sources are on the bottom, and then the years on the top. So you can see Green Valley Creek uh, has the the most robust record of any of these tributaries. There's, you know, a lot of a lot of record of of salmonids using Green Valley Creek, uh, Atascadero, you know, some but less so, um, and in some cases there was no you know no record or none were found. Um, so an interesting, just interesting to look at this, and this is. Um, Going all the way back to the very beginning, Isaac Sullivan mentioned that that you caught salmon in Green Valley Creek and you caught steelhead in Atascadero. So uh, they were kind of known to have different populations even in the 1850s, which is interesting because uh, I think that's still pretty true. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, I, if I'm over speaking there. Um, so I'm just going to end with a picture of a coho from Green Valley and, and thanks everyone and I'm open to questions. Thanks, Arthur. If anybody has a pressing question, please raise your hand, but otherwise um, we'll hold questions and um, answer them together after um, we get to the presentations. Are there any hands up? All right, right. you'll stop sharing, Arthur, and then we can turn yeah. to the okay. okay. Thank you so much, Arthur. Uh -huh. Mariska, you're on mute if you're starting. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I'm having screen troubles. I gotta <laughs> start again. <laughs> I know. Here we go. Let me start my presentation again. All right, can you see my screen? Not yet. Yes. Yep. Okay. And is it in the right view? It is. <laughs> okay. Great. Um well, great. I'm hi everyone and I'm really excited to tell you about what we've been learning in um Green Valley and um mostly Atascadero. I'm actually gonna um I'm ha I've been having some internet issues, so I'm just gonna uh I guess I'm not gonna turn my video off. Um we'll see how it goes. Um I I wanted to just acknowledge um Will Boucher. Um he is the biologist that really led all the data collection that I'm gonna share today. Um and then Andrew is our our um, map maker. So he's just wanted to thank him as well. I thought I would just start um, going over some basic um, coho life stage terminology with some photos because it can get really confusing. We use a lot of different um, names for fish at different life stages. So um, the coho and the Russian um, tend to spawn and, and spend the first part of their lives in the smaller streams. They usually um, emerge from the gravel in, in early spring, usually in March, as fry. We also, at this stage, we call them young of the year or yoy. They're usually about like an inch long. Um, then they spend about um, a little over a year in the stream environment and they grow to a few inches. Um, they start getting these marks on their side called par marks um, that helps them camouflage in the streams. And um, at this stage, they're called par. Sometimes you'll hear people say fingerlings, um, but they get up to a few inches long. Um, later on, I'm going to talk about releases of fish, and this is the stage that that fish hatchery fish get released in the Russian, um, for the most part. 
so then these fish, after about a little over a year in the stream environment, they make this incredible migration out to the ocean in between March and June. Um, and at that stage, they're called smolts. And you can see this fish is really different looking. It's um, becoming, it's a, ready for the ocean environment. It's becoming silver, so it can be camouflaged in the ocean. It's long and skinny. It's got dark fin margins. Those are all characteristics of smolts that are making our way out to the ocean. So then they spend um, uh, often about a year and a half in the ocean environment, fe feeding and growing. And then they return to the streams in the winter season to spawn. So when they spend over about a year and a half in the ocean, they come back as three-year-old adults. But some of the fish come back um, after being in the ocean just for a few months. And those are two-year-old fish that are usually males and you'll hear people call them jacks. Um, here's just a picture of um, a, a female coho here and a, a, probably a jack building a red. So the females um, usually are the ones who dig the red. They turn on their side and dig a nest in the gravel where they lay their eggs called a red. Um, their tail gets really beat up in that process. And usually that's, if you see that white tail, it's a female. Um, and then here's what's going on underneath the gravel. Um, you know, this is the eggs. And then they emerge from the eggs and stay um, in this larval stage for a little while. Um, it's called an elven. You can see the yolk sac. Um, they're very vulnerable. Um, and then once they've used up their yolk sac, they emerge as frog. In the Russian, um, coho almost disappeared altogether. In the early 2000s, there were less than 10 fish known to return each year. Um, and then as a result of some really intensive recovery work, um, we're now seeing fish in you know, the hundreds come back to the Russian. And that's really been the result of um, a lot of different um, key strategies. One of them is um, hatchery releases from a, a conservation hatchery based at Warm Springs Dam. And then a lot has been just this um, huge effort to, uh, by Goldridge and, and a lot of other organizations to try to restore habitat and increase stream flow. So um, really encouraging that we're now seeing hundreds of fish come back um, but just to kind of put it in the long-term goal perspective, um, you know, we'd like to see over 10,000 fish coming back to the watershed. So we still have a long way to go. We're making good progress, but there's a lot more work to do. And the fact that it's kind of leveling out at a few hundred to me just says we need to um, just continue doing more work to improve habitat so that it can support more than a few hundred coho. So this is kind of where this whole Atascadero project comes in. Um, you know, I think historically the Atascadero watershed was probably very important, not just for the Green Valley population, but um, for other um, watersheds in the basin as well. We started getting really interested in this watershed um, because we had been doing a lot of work in Green Valley and kind of through her word of mouth, we heard about um, this creek on the left, Redwood Creek up in the Atascadero watershed that had cold flowing water during the summer, even in drought conditions, which is really a rarity in the Russian. Um, so many creeks dry out. so. This seemed like some really potentially amazing over summer rearing habitat for coho. Um, then coho also need uh, refuge from high flow events um, and this low gradient kind of habitat um, provides them shelter from high flows. And it can also um, provide a lot of food aquatics and invertebrates that live in this habitat that coho like to eat. And so 
this combination in Atascadero um, uh, just has a lot of potential. Um, but as Sierra kind of alluded to, there are also some some questions, you know, um, how is the water quality? And given some of the land use um, that Arthur talked about, you know, what is the condition now? Are fish able to, to use this habitat? So that's kind of where um, the monitoring work that we um, set out to do came in. So one of the really, um, really useful things about having a conservation hatchery program um, is that you have this population of juvenile coho that you can tag and track and learn from. Um, so we, we tag um, these fish with pit tags. These are the same chips into cats and dogs um, in case you lose them. They're about the size of a grain of rice and we can implant them into the fish and then we can run um, these antennas in the streams um, and it's kind of like a fast track system for fish that when they swim over these antennas it records the tag number and the date and the time and so that's the approach we took um, to trying to learn about how fish were using a Tascadero um, so uh, I'm going to orient you to this map so here's the Russian River Here's Green Valley Creek, Purrington Creek, and here's Atascadero, and then here's Redwood. So we had um, the, the hatchery program released fish into Redwood Creek with pit tags um, between 2017 and 2021, so for five years. Um, and then for um, additional years, they've been releasing fish into Green Valley in the upper reaches and then Purrington Creek as well. So we wanted to take advantage of these pit tag fish and put antennas out and try to learn something about a Tascadero. These dots here are the, where we put the antennas. So these orange ones are ones that we have been running for many years as part of the hatchery monitoring. Um, and then these red dots were ones that Will put out just specifically to look at use in a Tascadero and um, hone in on the project reach. This is kind of a zoom in of the project reach in lower Tascadero. So really, um, there were two kind of main questions that we were trying to answer with our monitoring. Um, the first one was about the redwood creek fish. So they spend about a year and a half, a little less than a year and a half in the, in the stream environment. And then they have to move downstream through a Tascadero on their way to the ocean in the spring. And so we, we wanted to track whether they were able to survive in redwood and make this migration through Tascadero, through the project reach and um, show up at Green Valley. So that was one question. The second question was, do fish that are um, released in Green Valley and Purrington, um, are they using this overwinter habitat in a Tascadero, that nice low gradient habitat? Are they moving around before the spring that they leave as smolts, are they going up into a Tascadero during the winter? So the first question I'll start with is, is redwood. So fish that get released here, how many fish did we detect in, you know, Honeve, um, right downstream of redwood, and then at all of these antennas going downstream, and did any of them make it to Green Valley? Um, so I know there's a lot in this table, um, but I'll walk you through it. Um, so there were five releases of fish into Redwood. Here's the numbers of pit tag fish that got released um, each year. And then here's the number of detections at each antenna. So it's going from upstream, like in Honeve, all the way down through Tascadero to Green Valley. Um, so we'll start with, you know, did they make it out of Redwood? Um, where they, did we get detections at Honeymead? Um, first year we didn't have antennas and then 
you can see um, it, we did see fish um, making it, surviving in Redwood and, and making it to Honeve. Um, that number really varied. Um, we saw quite a few in, uh, for a couple years. And then in the drought years, we didn't see as many, but some were still making it through. Um, then, then, okay, did they make it through a Tascadero? Um, we didn't have antennas in a Tascadero for the, the uh, earlier years, but we did have this antenna in Green Valley. So for two years, um, we don't know exactly what happened in Green Valley, but um, I mean, in a Tascadero, but we did see some fish make it through. Sierra alluded to these fish. And so not a lot of them made it through, but some did. Um, and that big May storm is kind of when they moved through. Um, but we also know that some fish, you know, from these releases didn't make it through. Sierra saw dead fish. Um, so it was kind of mixed. Um, but then in these next three years, um, we did see some fish making it through red, redwood, but very few, um, uh, you know, making it into a Tascadero and no fish making it through the project reach and all the way to Green Valley. So I think the message here is, you know, it's possible, you know, probably under certain conditions where, and we think it's really, really related to water quality, they are making it through, but a lot of times they're not making it through. So next question um, was about these Green Valley and Purrington releases, or any of those fish going up into a Tascadero and trying to use that habitat in the winter. Um, and this was really exciting data. Um, we did see um, over 300 coho um, detected at, at this lower antenna in a Tascadero, um, right at the downstream end of the project reach. So those fish, you know, swam down Green Valley and upstream um, about a third of a kilometer and, and tried to enter the project reach. And then um, we had 58 detections and these are unique fish that went all the way through the project reach and were detected at the upper end. And then there was one detection of a fish that went all the way up into Honeve. Um, so there is some evidence that fish are trying to use that habitat. Um, and then here's just the breakdown of where those fish came from. So 230 of the fish came from fish that were released in Green Valley right here. So they swam down and up into a Tascadero. And then 116 were from Purrington. And then we had one fish that came from a from Dutchville Creek. So that was quite a big swim up the main stem of the river and then all the way up into Green Valley. So that was kind of neat. Um, the fish that entered a Tascadero, 20% um, of them we late we later detected going out as smolts in uh, you know at this Green Valley antenna. But 80% of them we never saw again. So it does seem like there's some evidence that even though fish are going in there, um, they may not be surviving that venture into um, a Tascadero. Um, so that's all the, the data I, I'm going to show today. Um, just to sum up, um, we learned that um, you know, under some conditions, it does seem like uh, juvenile coho are able to make it through a Tascadero, through the project reach. But in most years, it does seem like um, there are um, some impediments to migration and survival um, that we, you know, we think are probably related to the water quality issues that um, other partners on this project are, are documenting. Um, and then, you know, lastly, that Coho, um, we also, I didn't show steelhead data, but Coho and steelhead do um, seem to be moving up and trying to use that habitat in, in a Tascadero. And those kinds of movements, um, you know, habitat like that can be really important, not just for, you know, the, the watershed um, that the fish originated from, but like, you know, we saw Dutch bill fish trying to go in there. So I think probably historically, 
there were fish from other parts of the watershed that likely went into a Tascadero. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Um, there's a lot more in our report. Um, if you Google Russian River Coho, our website will come up and, and you can download that report. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Marcia, that was great. Um, and now to talk a little bit more about some of those water quality issues. <laughs> uh, knowing you from Stillwater Sciences um, is gonna give a um, presentation on water and sediment quality and um, on some of the wetland habitat assessment system. Thanks, Yara, and hi, everybody. Let's see. Does that work? Not seen it yet. Nope. Hmm. Really big jinx. I'm sorry. Try again. Oh, I see what I'm supposed to do. Get it. Yep, you can see it. it's just not in the presentation. Yeah. How about now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so for, as uh, Sierra mentioned, uh, Gold Ridge has been monitoring water quality for, I don't know, the last five to eight years and uh, first sort of spot checks and then more of these continuous um, uh, mo monitoring efforts that they engaged in. Um, the fish kill observation prompted some questions about, you know, what are the potential agents for that. Uh, when we first thought about the project, we began to think about sort of acute uh, toxicants or, you know, mortality stressors, you know, things like temperature, oxygen. Uh, and in terms of water quality, uh, the only real kind of uh, candidates might be things like free ammonia or sulfides in a wetland setting. And so we went ahead and um, did some seasonal sampling as well as the continuous sampling that uh, Sierra and Goldridge uh, under, under had, have been undertaking. So we uh, took a series of in-situ profiles and um, sulfide uh, sampling throughout the, the wetland area, just examined nutrients to sort of look at the, the, the um, potential for sort of eutrophication, sort of excessive growth within the wetland um, there was not a lot of um, high flows in, in 21 uh, when we did this sampling event. And we um, were plotting up here in the next couple slides of uh, some of the in-situ monitoring that Gold Rich did. Noah, can you just really quickly explain eutrophication? So, oh, yeah, sure. Um, so the idea um, that we do have a um, you know community wastewater uh, plant here for Grayton. Uh, and they discharge, uh, you know, some of their flow here. They do a lot of, they try to recycle a lot of it, but there's still residual nutrients from that, as well as other nutrients from the watershed. So you, uh, eutrophication is essentially, uh, you might use the word luxuriant or, or over-fertilized uh, growth and, and things like uh, uh, algal blooms uh, and crashes, which cause big uh, anoxia, or just simply just a lot of vegetated uh, sort of, annual production in even wetlands like um, duckweed or other kinds of aquatic plants that can die off and produce big uh, big drops in oxygen uh, is sort of the, the hallmark of a eutrophic, eutrophic, eutrophic system in addition to, to sort of, um, you know, aesthetic concerns. Um, it's not that it doesn't happen in natural settings, you know, big algal blooms or uh, growth and die off of things, but um, that's kind of what we were curious about when we started this. So this is um, sort of a, a, these are water quality profiles. So the vertical axis is depth and then the horizontal axis is oxygen. And you can see uh, you drop, you know, within a very short distance below the water surface, you drop down to pretty much to zero oxygen. And that is not inconsistent with wetlands this is what wetlands do. Um, they essentially, um, the, the plants prevent wind mixing of surface waters that normally in a riverine reach would also uh, tumble 
uh, you know, across riffles and, and re-aerate along the stream course. But in a wetland, the oxygen is really limited to the, the first, uh, the surface layer. And so you'll get things like mosquito fish or, you know, little tiny fish that can, you know, fish can survive at the surface, but in general, uh, it's a big block of water that's anoxic and that's kind of what makes peat and, uh, you know, all sorts of special things about wetlands. Um, another piece here is that wetlands also naturally produce acid conditions as bacteria decompose the, the plant matter. So there were circumstances where pH occasionally fell below the lower limit, six and a half here, you can see on the first tile on the left. Uh, so there's a few few events where we we see we're right at the the edge. This is not really at a sort of a mortality or toxicity threshold, but it's um, it's it's not within the the recommended water quality objectives for the the greater um, Bay Area here. Um, so this is a, a similar plot that uh, Sierra showed before. So the um, the blue is oxygen readings and the yellow is stage or water level, which is equivalent to flow. And you can see that when we have a high flow event, um, you do get oxygen climbing up. There's enough turbulence and re-aeration and transport of oxygenated waters from upstream that you can make passable conditions through the marsh. But then as soon as the flows drop down, the oxygen drops down too. So there's extended periods of uh, anoxic conditions that um, are occurring. And when are the fish moving through? Uh, that's just sort of shown here, you know, December, February is what we're assuming the up migration is. And then the, the, uh, the uh, smolts will potentially be coming out March through May. And um, it looks like your, your, uh, your up migrants are more lucky than your, your out migrants. If you don't, unless you have big storm events, at least in this particular uh, situation, um, last year was a pretty wet year. Um, do, we, do you have what kind of flow did we have last year in the spring? There were a couple of events, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so that, you know, it's it's kind of you're waiting for these big events and then those you'll have whole year class failures unless you have of uh, coho, unless you have some big uh, flow event. So that's not a great way to run a <laughs> run a, a, a habitat for uh, salmon and coho. Um, so this is just a picture of um, nutrient conditions and it does show pretty high nitrogen levels and phosphorus levels in the area. So there's, there is definitely some residual nutrients uh, coming in. And then um, this term BOD, biological oxygen demand, in the water column, we were trying to get a sense of what is sort of the oxygen demand from sediment, from organic matter. Um, so we did, this is just a simple water sample in, in 2021. And that's below the um, regulatory standard for the discharge from the uh, wastewater. So that's that's not bad, but it still pulls down oxygen levels in the water column unless there's some re source of re-aeration. So this is a clue that why you're why you're not seeing uh, oxygen in the water column. Uh, so the summary of this is that we see hypoxic conditions persistently, um, you know, except during st storm runoff. We do see elevated uh, nutrient levels ab above uh, baseline. We did not, we did find uh, very low levels of ammonia and very low levels of sulfide, but they're not anywhere near toxicity thresholds. So in terms of the toxicant uh, question, we're fairly certain this was basically an oxygen uh, crash is what caused our, our fish mortality event. Um, so as another piece of this, we, again, we were continuing on the, um, the oxygen uh, pursuit. And the other question was, what are these sediments that are arriving uh, from the upper watershed um, you know, or what are, what are the effects of the wastewater discharger, or any of those sorts of things. So we did some toxicity screening tests. We ran through sort of standard uh, lists of um, priority um, metal pollutants and other other uh, uh, compounds. 
And then we also looked at oxygen demand in sediment cores that we collected, um, sediment oxygen demand to, to make some estimates of uh, oxygen in the water column from that. So we collected some uh, push core samples at a few locations in the marsh. And then we did this uh, lab testing for sort of um, common, uh, this CAM means the California assessment methodology, I think, 17 heavy metals. And we added um, chrome and mercury to that, pesticides, PCBs, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and cyanide, um, just to see what we could see. And uh, so from those, this is just a quick view of the oxygen depletion. This the You can sort of see at the upper right, there's three little um, chambers here that have uh, sediment in the bottom and they're with oxygen probes in them and they're mixed um, at different rates to simulate water velocity moving and probably the low or the no mix would be most appropriate um, for our, our wetland situation. But you can make some estimates uh, using a, a box model. So from these oxygen demand estimates, we were figuring about um, uh, between, between about a gram per square meter per day of oxygen disappears in the wetland. And that was then turned into a, a simplified model of water moving through the wetland. Um, we'll get to that in a second. In terms of the toxicity screening, there is a, a series of, um, I think I've got this right. Screening quick reference tables, squirt, cute, uh, as well as the San Francisco Regional Board develop some dredge sediment screening guidelines. So this is these are developed for dredging harbors. Uh, there really actually aren't that many um, accepted sediment quality standards. There's a lot of regional differences in geology and background concentrations and things like that. But the these folks did go to the trouble of compiling. Um, you know, at no effects levels and concentrate concentrations that cause uh, problems for amphipods or fish or, you know, those sorts of things. So we um, we went and ahead and compared them to these screening guidelines. In general, there was a couple of exceptions. They were generally below um, uh, method detection limits and screening thresholds, but there were a couple of exceptions. We did see some trace metals, chrome and nickel, um, above the screening thresholds. This is not to like some toxic... Uh, you know, problem, but it's, there are, there. it's off the bottom, you know, up on the bottom rungs of the ladder in terms of concern. And then we also saw some DDT metabolites. So these are um, decomposition byproducts of the legacy uh, DDT from the 60s or 50s or whenever that was used in the watershed. So they, these, that's sort of in, in small uh, concentrations. Um, we did also, oops, um, we went ahead and just um, just to sort of backfilling some information gaps that are needed. We did a wetland mapping um, of different uh, cover types of wetland habitat types uh, throughout the project area. And this had to do with some questions that Jeremy's going to get into in terms of the inundation of the site under different sediment removal um, uh, scenarios that we examined. And uh, um, OEI did some hydro hydraulic modeling to, and we had some estimates of annual annual inundation. And it looks like we're going, well, we'll get to it. Uh, I think Jeremy will get to that uh, in terms of uh, conversion of wetland habitat types or things like that. We're pretty sure we will just con converting from perennial to seasonal in a lot of locations. That's I guess the, the punchline of this. And then um, sort of this is the, I guess this is sort of like the last um, sum summary. So talked about the idea that oxygen is l consistently low. We do not think we have a chemical toxicity issue. Um, we are likely to see uh, some hypoxia, so low oxygen conditions under base flow. Um, it looks like even modest uh, flows through the site can get um, oxygen levels up. And so that was part of the good news is that if we undertake some sediment, some of the sediment removal and restore a little bit of a, a fluvial channel through the site, 
uh, we could probably improve oxygen conditions. It's not like we won't see uh, oxygen in summer low, uh, but if you'll see some storm event or you know low uh, modest uh, rain event or something, even a small amount of velocity through the site is likely to improve oxygen sufficiently for fish passage. Uh, so I think that is it. Thanks, Noah. All right, so Jeremy Kobor um, with Matt O'Connor chiming in as needed um, are going to present the next phase, which is hydraulic modeling and um, some of the design, um, the intermediate design that we've come up with to address some of the issues in the marsh. All right, thanks, Sierra. Give us a sec here to get the presentation mode. There we go. Okay, just a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'll sort of be touching on various aspects that have already been presented, hopefully giving you a, um, an overall flavor of the different analyses that we've done and the uh, design that we've come up with for this project. Uh, so I'll start talking a little bit about existing conditions at the site. Um, in particular, what we think are the causes of accumulating sediment and low oxygen, um, also known as hypoxia. Uh, we'll talk about some of the restoration goals, um, the development of 65% uh, design plans for a project to remove sediment, and um, then some of our analysis of how we think that project, once implemented, um, will affect the, the wetland and uh, habitat conditions. Um, and lastly, we'll talk a little bit about Sorry, Jeremy, to interrupt. Is there any way to be a little bit louder? We've just gotten folks saying it's a little bit difficult to hear. Okay, um, I will try to talk a little louder here. Thank you. Um, and we'll wrap up talking about longevity of the project and kind of our next steps going forward. Okay, I just want to point out a few of the site features. Um, some of this you've seen before. Uh, we're kind of zoomed in on the confluence area of the Tascadero and Green Valley. We've got Green Valley Creek here on the left side, uh, Tascadero Creek kind of coming in diagonally. Uh, the confluence is actually just off the figure here. Uh, so here's Green Valley Road. Um, most of uh, the project we're talking about is sort of in this reach between Green Valley and, and the confluence. Uh, there's a feature here um, just off the wastewater treatment plant known as uh, Lake Grayton. It's basically a, a part of the wetland marsh that was burned historically, likely for agricultural purposes, and is kind of disconnected from the marsh uh, by these shallow berms. Uh, Gold Ridge has already designed a, a separate project to breach portions of this berm and restore uh, hydraulic conductivity across that feature. Uh, the sediment accumulation itself is denoted here as a riffle crest. Um, and what you'll notice about the location of that is it's uh, pretty coincident with where we have flows uh, leaving Green Valley Creek, flowing over Green Valley Road uh, through the adjacent vineyard, and then returning to Atascadero, uh, pretty much coincident with where we have the sediment accumulation. And I'll talk more about, about that, but there's definitely a connection between uh, the flooding issues on Green Valley Creek. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with that. Maybe you've driven through that while it's been at flood stage. Um, and uh, last feature I'll just mention, since it hasn't been talked about, um, there was a historic roadway between Grayton and Forestville before 116 went in that actually cut right through the marsh here. And there's some um, remnants of that historic uh, wooden bridge structure that are still out there in the wetland. It's in obviously a pretty dilapidated state, um, you know, not probably presenting a big problem as a fish passage barrier, but um, part of our project will try to uh, remove some of that, um, what is essentially, you know, junk at this point sitting in the, in the wetland left over from that historic bridge. Okay, this map here shows a, a topographical profile of the stream channel. Um, starting up at Grayton Road and going all the way down below the confluence with Green Valley uh, down to below Ross Station Road. And what you see here is it looks like a typical stream um, in the upper and downstream portions where you have uh, you know, gently down sloping stream channel as you might expect to see. 
However, there's this reach between Green Valley Road and the confluence where you've got um, what we call an adverse slope or a, a you know, closed depression. Basically, there's this area of sediment accumulation uh, that um, results in uh, water being impounded behind it in what we um, are calling this perennial wetland area. And so that's water that, that's uh, basically trapped there uh, during the summer months, um, you know, com almost completely stagnant. And um, that's a lot of what's leading to the uh, poor dissolved oxygen conditions that we've been discussing. Um, and we believe that that uh, perennial wetland is essentially formed by this relatively recent accumulation of sediment here. Okay, uh, we've done some investigation of the subsurface sediments to, to better understand the system here. Uh, what you're seeing here are four boreholes that were um, excavated into the shallow subsurface. The colors there show the proportion of clay-rich materials in those samples. And what you'll notice as you get close, this is uh, right in the sediment accumulation area, by the way. Um, what you'll notice is the relatively high clay content shown with the red colors there in the boreholes that are um, you know, within the lower end of that uh, perennially inundated area uh, compared to locations farther downstream that have uh, relatively lower proportions of clay. And um, this is important because we think um, essentially the uh, closed depression or the uh, impoundment behind that sediment accumulation has been sorting sediments out, uh, allowing finer material like clay to drop out. Um, and there's some feedback there. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy as that water is um, stagnant, more and more clay drops out of the water column and you get sort of a sealed uh, condition to, that helps that water to persist and stay all summer long there. Um, also interesting to note are where the groundwater levels were in these boreholes. Uh, you can see that um, we've got a water surface up here at about 89 feet. Uh, it's a summer water surface in the wetland, uh, but immediately downstream in these boreholes, uh, water is um, you know, five, six feet lower. Um, so that suggests there's sort of a disconnection between the water that's ponded in the wetland and what's happening in the, in the water table regionally. Um, so we think this water is not necessarily being supported at this elevation by groundwater, rather it's being um, uh, trapped by, uh, by the fine sediment that's sort of lining the, the bed of the wetland. I just want to interject that um, water leaking in from Sullivan Creek through so-called Lake Grayton may be helping support sort of this summer water. That's sort of the only surface water source we know of that kind of persists in, in through the summer, through that time. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so we've done um, a lot of different types of analysis of, of this system. Um, we've built a fairly sophisticated um, hydraulic and hydrologic model. Uh, this model actually covers a much bigger area. Uh, we're using it to evaluate a whole suite of projects that Sierra mentioned at the beginning of the, the talk tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at how these different projects interact with each other, um, as well as look at uh, effects of individual projects. So this model goes all the way from about Occidental Road uh, down below Rock Station Road and also covers Lower Green Valley Creek. Um, it uses a what we call flexible mesh where we can represent different areas of the system in different levels of detail, uh, depending on um, what type of features are there. So for example, channels are represented uh, in a great level of detail, uh, areas where there's less topographic variation like the vineyard uh, represented in less detail. Sorry about that, go ahead. No worries. Um, okay, so, so a model like this uh, simulates the patterns of water flow, uh, you know, how much uh, inundation extent and flooding we get at different flow conditions. Um, water depths and water velocities. Uh, one of the ways we really like to use these results are to relate them to suitability for different uh, salmonid species. Uh, so uh, juvenile coho have pretty particular requirements in terms of uh, how deep the water needs to be and how fast or slow it needs to be moving. Um, in particular, they're very sensitive to the water velocity. They really like slow moving water. 
Um, and so we can use these model results to uh, come up with estimates for how suitable the habitat is um, at different flow conditions. So on the top here, you see a map of habitat suitability for juvenile coho. Um, the uh, blue and green areas are high habitat value. And then the uh, yellows and oranges and grays are very lo are lower habitat value. Uh, the top map shows a base flow condition during the winter, so kind of a typical winter flow in between storms. And then the bottom figure shows a, a sort of moderate flow event, something like a two-year recurrence interval flood event. Um, and what you'll notice is here is a lot of uh, very excellent habitat, um, you know, very wide uh, inundation widths. This is something that's very rare in the Russian River, certainly nowhere else in Green Valley, Atascadero like this. Um, that can uh, inundate these wide areas at very uh, common winter flows and maintain these very low velocities. So this is a, a really important habitat characteristic, probably explains why there's a lot of coho, um, as Mariska was talking about, moving up from Green Valley and other places into this area, trying to take advantage of this slow water habitat um, that again is, is really rare that you um, have conditions where flows can spread out to this degree. Okay, we've seen these figures a couple of times, so I'm not gonna dwell on them too much, um, but yeah, we have really pretty great records now of how the uh, water surface elevation in the marsh changes over time and how the dissolved oxygen changes in concert with those water levels. Um, you can see there the, the regional target dissolved oxygen of uh, six milligrams per liter and uh, what's been defined as a lethal threshold of about three milligrams per liter. And um, just to really harp on this point, and, you know, we're really only seeing oxygen levels reach target levels or even get above lethal thresholds for relatively short periods of time during uh, storm events. Um, after the storm recedes, the dissolved oxygen quickly drops down to a near zero uh, condition. So very, very problematic for, for fish. Um, there's, you know, they may have some ability to use this area uh, but essentially this uh, low dissolved oxygen is a, a pretty severe limiting factor for um, coho salmon's ability to use this habitat or even to just migrate through it. Um, what I'm showing on the right there is a compilation of a, a bunch of studies actually from around the world um, that have pretty uh, nicely documented the relationship between uh, macro invertebrates uh, that live in the water. Um, as a function of dissolved oxygen. So it's not just um, fish and it's not just coho that are affected by these low dissolved oxygen conditions. Um, you know, biodiversity in general is gonna be much lower um, in a low dissolved oxygen environment and the more, um, more oxygen rich the water is, the more um, aquatic organisms can uh, uh, thrive and persist in that environment. So not, not just about fish, although um, that is certainly the focus of, of a lot of our work given their um, endangered status. Painfully slow to advance here. There okay. Okay, good. okay. Um, we also did some analysis of historical aerial photography. Um, Arthur did a nice job of explaining some of the historical maps and we did some similar interpretation of the um, air photos. Uh, the oldest photo we have is from 1942. You can see that on the top there. Um, that yellow circle shows the lake, what's currently the Lake Graydon area uh, next to the treatment plant. Um, and then if you sort of compare that photo to the bottom right, um, relatively recent photo from 2016, uh, you can pretty quickly notice some pretty substantial differences on the landscape there. Um, historically, the uh, marsh and the floodplain was very heavily managed, um, you know, primarily tr um, with the attempt to uh, drain lands and uh, create more suitable lands for agriculture. Um, even as late as 1980, you can see on the bottom left there, um, it looks like there was still some active uh, hay farming going on in uh, what is now the the perennial wetland. And then there's this pretty dramatic transition um, sometime you know, after 1980, uh, where you see this big expansion in riparian vegetation, and you see a big expansion in the extent of uh, perennial water and perennial inundation. 
Um, so we don't really know what things look like uh, prior to this 42 photo exactly, but um, we, do, we do have pretty good evidence that this shift from seasonal wetland that would be flooded in the winter to perennial wetland that's flooded all summer and, and winter um, occurred relatively recently, probably in the, the 1980s. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, situation over at Green Valley Road. Again, we, we think that the uh, sediment accumulation that's resulted in this wetland change is uh, largely as a result of the um, relatively frequent flooding we see on Green Valley Road. Um, Arthur showed you uh, this map on the bottom left there showing a historical alignment of Purrington and Green Valley Creeks. Uh, you'll note the position of uh, what was Purrington Creek is essentially along the alignment of where we now see flows leaving uh, Green Valley Creek, uh, flowing over Green Valley Road and going through the vineyard uh, back to our sediment accumulation area. Um, so that's interesting to note. Um, Arthur also mentioned how Purrington was uh, probably, um, you know, uh, diverted into Green Valley Creek so that they flowed together over the last uh, several hundred feet there. Um, you can imagine that would have created a, a big change in the drainage area in Green Valley Creek, um, perhaps leading to um, you know, a period of channel adjustment that might still be going on today. Um, if we look at the image on the right, we can see the channels of Green Valley Creek in this orange polygon. And what we basically have are a series of levees that have been built over the Decades, uh, we've got um, a driveway on the left bank serving as a levee, um, a feature downstream of the bridge on the right bank that's um, a levee-like feature. And then Green Valley Road itself is essentially acting as a low, ineffective levee. And so what we've done over time basically is force Green Valley Creek to stay in its um, channel at this particular alignment. Um, through construction of levees and through historical dredging activities. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen a lot of deposition happening in the channel. Um, we've documented about nine feet of deposition at the Green Valley Road Bridge since uh, the late 60s. Um, so that's a pretty substantial amount of sediment. And we've seen the road flooding um, problem increase over time. And then we've also seen this formation of the sediment accumulation. Um, I don't think I mentioned that, um, you know, this confluence area is basically an alluvial fan setting, and that's a type of uh, geomorphic setting where we expect the, uh, the channels to shift and move over time. And I think we have a lot of evidence from Arthur's um, looking at the historical maps that, yeah, that confluence and area really did shift and change over time. And so um, we think we're kind of in a, a state of disequilibrium now because we've essentially forced Green Valley to stay um, in its channel uh, because of the infrastructure we put around it. Um, and that's um, caused these sedimentation issues. Okay, this is just a few thick pictures of flooding at Green Valley Creek. Um, this was from quite a few years ago. Things are a little better now after some emergency work that Sonoma Water did out there. Um, but if folks haven't seen this, it's, it's pretty dramatic. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, water exiting Green Valley Creek on the left side of this image, flowing over the road and, and through the vineyard. Um, in the past, that's been erosive enough to actually do some pretty serious damage to the pavement um, that's been since patched up. Um, as I mentioned, things are a little better right now due to some of the emergency dredging work. However, we expect things to start shifting back to this kind of chronic flooding condition over time if uh, more interventions aren't taken there. Um, we've also taken a look at how sediment uh, is moved through the system. Um, this is some of the sediment transport analysis we did, uh, looking at two different sizes of material. So uh, a very small material like silt on the top, and then some uh, larger material, um, uh, you know, coarse sand, fine gravel on the bottom. And the different colors here just show you how uh, mobile those different materials are um, under this particular flow condition. So blue shows where we don't expect that material to be mobile at all. And then as we move into the greens and the 
oranges and the reds, uh, we get to more mobile uh, sediment that can easily be transported. Um, so there's a couple of interpretations we make from this. Um, one is the marsh reach itself is not really capable of transporting sediment, even um, small sediment like silt. You can see that material is expected to be immobile. Um, so that tells us, you know, the source of the sediment accumulation can't really be the Atascadero watershed upstream uh, because there's just not enough velocity and stream power to uh, move that material down through the reach to the sediment accumulation. Um, in stark contrast, we can look at the uh, bright colors we see uh, flowing out of Green Valley Creek through the vineyard, right towards our sediment accumulation area, suggesting that, yeah, sediment can pretty readily um, move across that flow path and to the sediment accumulation area. And so we feel pretty confident that most of the material we see accumulated is coming from uh, Green Valley Creek or um, soils eroded in the vineyard. Um, and then in the bottom figure, you can see how um, while material can, can be relatively mobile all along that flow path, once it hits the sediment accumulation, uh, it really doesn't have much ability to move farther downstream because we're again in that kind of slow velocity environment. So uh, conditions are, are pretty much set up for um, a sediment to accumulate there. So it's not too surprising that that's what we've been seeing over time. Okay, moving on to talk about some of the goals of our restoration project. Uh, really, the primary goal is pretty simple. Uh, we've identified this low dissolved oxygen or hypoxic condition as being um, very limiting to the ability for salmonids to use this watershed, or this part of the watershed anyway. And so our primary goal is to try to reduce the underlying conditions that we believe are responsible for uh, causing this hypoxia and uh, those are uh, perennial inundation, slow moving water, limited circulation, uh, high biological oxygen demand. Um, secondary goals, um, we know we have this really good low velocity winter refugia habitat. We wanna preserve those characteristics. We don't wanna change uh, what is functioning in the wetland. We just wanna to try to fix or improve this oxygen condition. Um, and we'd also like to ensure some longevity to the project if we're gonna go in and. Uh, cause disturbance and um, implement this project, we'd like to know that it'll last a while and we won't expect to have to be going in to uh, do something similar in the relatively near future. Come on slides, you can do it. We're getting tired. Okay, oh, went too far. So Jeremy, if you can wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. Okay, I'll try to speed along here. Um, so we've come up with a design that we've advanced to the 65% stage um, with the, the assistance of uh, others on the call here. Um, it's pretty simple. It's basically looking at this area of sediment accumulation and excavating a channel through it um, that restores uh, connectivity of flow and connectivity of the topography uh, through the sediment accumulation. Um, you can see what that looks like in plan view on the bottom here, the existing topography here, and then our design topography here. Um, if you look on the bottom left, you can see what the extent of the proposed uh, excavation would be. It's essentially where you see the channel peter out and disappear on the upstream end. Um, and then down to where you see the channel pick up and reappear. Um, so returning it to sort of a continuous thread channel through the sediment accumulation is the, the basic idea. And we've done some uh, hydraulic modeling of the effects of this and um, shown that we can pretty effectively change what we call the hydro period of the wetland uh, to from um, what's currently perennial or you know, water that stays there all year to seasonal, meaning uh, it's still a wetland, but it's only wet during uh, the winter season and it dries out in the summer. Um, and then that Lake Great and Burr removal project will do something similar for this area that's currently impounded uh, behind berms as Lake Grayton. Um, also important to note that, um, you know, most of the Tascadero wetlands are not affected 
uh, by this project. They're already seasonal wetlands. And essentially what this project does is make this lower, very lowest part of the wetland look a lot more like what the wetland looks like currently. If you look at it around Graydon Road or Occidental Road, or even up further at Regal Ranch, uh, that's all seasonal, seasonal wetland and more like the type of habitat we're hoping to create here in the lower part of the wetland. Um, um, so that's sort of at a, lo a low flow summer condition. Uh, when the next slide comes up here, you'll see what it looks like at a, a pretty common winter flow. So this is a, um, a flow of about 100 CFS. You can think of it as a, a high winter base flow or a small storm event. Um, so although we see those big changes during the summer months and at low flows, uh, when we look at uh, you know, winter flows, even, even low winter flows, we really don't get a lot of change in um, how uh, much inundation and flooding we see, um, which is exactly what we're hoping to accomplish, uh, really change that summer condition, but not really change the winter condition. Um, I'll, I think I'll skip that top figure there for the... Um, benefits of time and focus on this lower figure. Um, this is one of the same plots I showed you earlier where you can see the uh, water quality in terms of dissolved oxygen in the wetland in orange. Uh, but what I've added here now is another station that's located between Graydon Road and Occidental Road in uh, yellow there. And we see a very different situation. So just a couple miles upstream where we have the seasonal wetland habitat um, we see uh, dissolved oxygen remaining in the 9, 10 milligram per liter range, well above our targets kind of throughout the winter months and uh, well into the, um, what we uh, think of as the small out migration season. Uh, so in my mind, this is um, you know, probably our best evidence that, yeah, if we can change the, the sort of the character of inundation, the seasonality of inundation in the wetland, we can expect some pretty substantial improvements in uh, dissolved oxygen conditions um, and basically make things look a lot more like they do upstream. I'm almost done here, Sierra, one, one or two more. Okay, we also um, did some more analysis of the um, cell model habitat suitability. Uh, long story short, you know, but we don't really change things during the winter. Uh, we preserve these low velocity, high value uh, habitat conditions. Um, even when we remove sediment. Um, so pretty, pretty big changes in the summer, very little change in the winter. Um, we have done some work to look at project longevity, um, kind of getting to the punchline. You know, we really need a project to address the Green Valley Road flooding to ensure that uh, this project has some longevity. Um, if we don't do that, uh, we can probably expect that the sediment accumulation will begin to reform and eventually the benefits of the project will go away. Um, that'll probably happen anyway, um, but we can really extend those timelines by taking action at uh, Green Valley Road and uh, Gold Ridge and uh, other partners are currently working on that um, effort as well. Uh, so just to kind of summarize, uh, the proposed project has a lot of uh, positive effects that we uh, were hoping to see. We think we can reduce the biological oxygen demand and the frequency and extent of um, stagnant or sluggish water, which we believe is causing these uh, low dissolved oxygen conditions. Uh, we think we can preserve the high suitability winter refugia habitat for fish over a wide range of winter flows. Um, it's still gonna be a low velocity environment, still gonna be a wetland. Uh, we can preserve a lot of the, you know, the majority of the wetland extent and the wetland benefits that we see today, uh, but improve the water quality. And uh, next steps are um, you know, soliciting and incorporating feedback from uh, various folks. And this meeting is part of that effort. And we'll be making adjustments to design as needed. And as we advance these plans to uh, kind of a construction uh, ready phase in the, in the coming months and, and years. And I'll end with that. Thank you, Jeremy. So I know we're at time um, and I apologize. We have so much to talk about in this project. Um, that we have a good bit over our allotted time. If there are any questions or any comments or feedback um, that folks would like to know or would like to ask, please do so. Um, and you can either raise your hand or you can put information in the chat. 
if you need to jump off and you want to send us uh, follow up questions, um, we will answer those um, directly to the right person for to get answered. All right. I'm not seeing any hands. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to, to jump in and ask them, or if you have any observations that you want to share, let us know. Hi, my name is Corinne Lees, and I used to live in Grayton. I live in Sebastopol now. But um, I was wondering how much, what are your plans as far as outreach, education, and activism of the general public? How do you have um, plans for that aspect of the project. I'm sorry, Karen, I don't understand your question. Um, how much outreach, education, and activism, how much, part, how much is that a part of this project? This is outreach that we're doing currently. What, what are, yeah, and um, as far as activism, what, are, what can citizens do? How can citizens support a project, is that? Yeah. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just not positive that I understand. I'm sorry. Yes. 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 Citizens can support. Yes. Yes. Um, citizens can support the projects by, again, feeding back into and letting us know, you know, what your observations are of the area. And we solicit um, letters of support from the Atascadero, Watersh Atascadero Green Valley Watershed Council, um, as well as other organizations like Friends of Atascadero Watershed. Um, I think our friends of Brayton. Um, so those are the types of organizations that we generally partner with and request input and review um, at different phases. So being involved with with your local watershed council um, and those areas, you can also you know be checking in with me. I'm the point person. Um, if you have you know questions or observations or things you'd like to feed back into the project, you're you're the contact person. I am. Okay. And your email is on the website or something. It is, yes. And I'm Sierra Cantor. You can find me a number of different ways on our website. This is Matt O'Connor. I'm I'm guessing that um, eventually this project would get to some sort of a permit stage where there would be perhaps another uh, public process surrounding the, the proposed project. So this this is sort of a a, a, a planning input, and that you know there there could be considerably more formal processes that would come later in the process. And Sierra, correct me if I'm wrong in that presumption. I'm not sure how much general public feedback there is in that, but it's certainly something that if there is, it goes before the board of supervisors um, or something like that. We will be certainly letting folks know. That would be an opportunity. I wanted to compliment you on um, putting us on next door. That's how I found out about it. And you've been very good about responding to people that, that make comments. So I think going with social media could really help with your outreach. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. Um, we have two questions in the chat. Thanks, Rose. I'm just, just looking at that. Are you are you wrapped up, Corinne? Did we complete your question or your feedback? I'm fine. Yeah, thank okay. you. So we had a question about um, was the, the oxygen level tested in Honeyeve Creek? Um, and the answer to that one is no, we didn't have a station. <clears throat> we did have a station in Redwood Creek. So we did um, put in a continuous water quality meter that um, measured dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, and conductivity, those four general parameters of water quality in Redwood. But we did not have an Atascadero Creek, or excuse me, I'm sorry, a Honey Creek station. Um, and that all that information is summarized in that Atascadero watershed management report that I showed at the beginning. That's on our website, and all that water quality data is shown in there of all the different stations over the different years. Um we have another. Um, when would the channeling project take place? What is the plan for dealing with Green Valley Road flooding? Um, that is an entirely different meeting, Greg, but we will, as far as uh, the timeline for this, um, we are looking at, so we're at, right now at the 65% or intermediate design phase. So we need to complete the designs and get them to 100% um, 
and then we need to start applying for funding to actually build this project. Um, and that includes getting all the permitting and all of the pieces, um, all the CEQA review, all of the, the components that go into making sure that we're, we're doing this properly and responsibly. So probably two to three years out, I would estimate. Um, and that may be optimistic, but that's what I'm uh, we're, we're aiming for, um, for the Atascadero um, piece of this. And then the Green Valley Road flooding, we're starting that process. Um, we are um, working with the county um, currently on trying to um, come up with kind of a scope of how we want to readdress that with the work that the county has been doing that Sonoma Water has done over the last couple of years. So we're picking that up and doing um, a further design process. Um, so that's, we don't know yet what we're going to do, but we are in the design and assessment phase. I have another question. <laughs> um, okay, hold on one second. Let me do this one last one. Um, yeah. I think this is because I think these are close. It says, will the restoration project go upstream towards Rachel Ranch Park? So this portion of the project is really bounded in by the area that we've been doing. <laughs> which is um, from Green Valley Road down to the confluent, um, Green Valley Road crossing of Atascadero down to the confluent of Atascadero and Green Valley Creeks. But we do have other projects that we're looking at, other um, areas where the creek has been really manipulated and where that goes up to about Occidental Road. And we have been talking to Regal um, Ranch Regional Park about trying to do some work with them um, with interpretive trails and um, some of the, the work through assessing a Tascadero through that reach and up to the Bodega Avenue crossing. Bryn. Yes. Bryn, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Is, um, is forest restoration or um, natural vegetation restoration have any part in the um, in future plans? Wouldn't that isn't that part of what is what the problems are? Is that all the vegetation, native vegetation, has been removed? Down, um, down in the project reach. Mm -hmm. None I mean, of it's not that it, it hasn't like been no removed. Tree. It, it hasn't been removed. It's that the the because the the hydrology has changed so much. Most of the trees that were in the the area that's now a marsh have died. And so most of the the and that's just a natural because of the inundation. Their you know their feet and their roots are too wet and they're not getting any oxygen. So those trees have died back. But the the native vegetation that's moved in there, there's a lot of willows. Um, that was in um, Noah's slide where he had kind of the mapping, and I can send that to you. We're going to post this whole presentation, but we'll also post um, each of the speakers' presentations, and you can take a look at that because there is quite a bit of native vegetation. All the way through the marsh it's just now converted into willows and a lot of um more um aquatic vegetation reeds rushes um tulies that kind of vegetation and then there's a lot of very non-native vegetation which is primarily the ludwigia um, which is that water primrose that covers the whole surface um and so that's not native but that's that that is not there is also a whole lot of native um, vegetation that is throughout the, the whole marsh area. Thank you, Sierra. Uh -huh. Great. Am I missing any other questions, Rose? Do you see anybody that I've missed? No, I don't see any more in the chat. I want to just quickly uh, acknowledge contributions uh, Eric Austinson has has made to this process as being a uh, very rugged uh, topographic surveyor and uh, doing uh, our, our, our design work as the project engineer. Uh, his, Thank you. Various parts of his work products appeared in, in our presentation and uh, just want to acknowledge him. Thank you. And I'll write on the coattails out of acknowledging the landowners, the private landowners that um, have allowed us access out there and who have been project partners in every part of this project um, and it couldn't happen without their participation and support. All right, last call for any questions or any comments or any feedback. Thank you so right. much. I learned so much tonight. Thank you for attending, I appreciate it. Thank you to everybody for spending your Tuesday evening with us. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Again, we will be posting this presentation as it's recorded 
um, in addition to um, the presentations um, from each speaker will be available if folks have questions or want to review that or um, see any of that additional information. And if in the shower tomorrow morning you come up with your question, which is where I always come up with my best questions, please feel free to email me um, or to um, give me a call. Either one is fine. Um, and let me know what you have. Bye. All right. Um, great. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to. Thank you for uh, being the MC, Sierra. Absolutely. Thank you for your presentations and all of your work each of you have done on this. As well. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you.